Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Cisco Systems, with support from NetApp. And now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. You are watching theCUBE here live in San Francisco on the ground, on the floor, inside the Cisco booth and also inside the Cube Logic booth. We have two CUBEs running today. This is SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program, the CUBE. We go out through the events, check the signals and noise. I'm John Furrier, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. I'm joined with Jeff Frick, co-host and GM of theCUBE. And we are excited to have our special guest here, Dan Hutchins, the CTO with CSC. Um, great consulting firm, changing the game, building your own clouds. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks very much, John. Really appreciate so a couple of things we want to do is we want to one, get your perspective of our new uh, product out of, that's out of this, the crowd chat um, venture which we've, we're in public beta with. You're one of our early adopter power users using it. But also this trend that Larry Ellison teased out in his keynote that you could tell he was reading from the script and he's, it's, it's not yet baked but certainly very relevant, the marketing cloud. And you're seeing a transformation in human capital management which is traditionally ERP and all that our CRM stuff to this whole new crowdsource front end, and he's listening to it, he kind of like hand wave like Twitter and that stuff. Yeah. So you can see they're not <laughs> really that that ready. Stuff. <laughs> but he mentioned listening, and this is the computer science uh, innovation happening yep. in the cloud. So I want to get your take on this new kind of engagement philosophy and culture that's changing. What's your take on that? You know, we're, we're seeing it too. Uh, one of the biggest things that we're seeing is that uh, fundamentally um, people have lives outside of work. And, uh, and they have lives at work that are external, right? We talk an awful lot about what we call the outside in enterprise, which is really a recognition that the value chain within the enterprise has fundamentally changed. It used to be that you had everything that you needed inside of your corporate boundary, but in this new world, the transfer cost now is much lower from outside providers than inside providers, right? If you ever tried to do, I mean, you're not in a big company, but you know, I got a bill the other day for $30,000 for a little bit of uh, graphics work on a presentation. I'm like, really? You know, and, and what we're recognizing is that that same tra internal transfer cost is playing out externally. And social media is certainly one of those areas in which, you know, by harnessing social media, we're able to reach far more people, both people who are employees, but also people who are customers and people who are, we want to be customers or want to be employees, and engage them in conversations and use that to determine whether or not those people are really the right fit uh, for the model that we're trying to move forward. So you mentioned that, you know, the graphics format, that's the data, right? The data is <laughs> formatted in a way that costs, in that case, $30,000, I'm sure it was beautifully, I mean, sure it was really probably amazing looking. But in the new channels, data is data. Data is the key value proposition. So sometimes it's not so much how it's presented, but it's actually the data itself. Absolutely. So what you're getting at here is with crowdsourcing and crowd, crowd spotting and crowd chatting, you can go out and get that done. There, there's an honesty in crowds, right? And um, there are uh, people who are willing to be more open and honest externally. Right, one of the, own thing, the things that we've done is that as we've undertaken our transformation, and we have a lot of technical resources inside of CSE, right? We have about 46,000 technologists inside the company, um, globally, right? With a huge basis of them, 22, 23,000 in India, for example. And um, we've had to overcome a lot of elements because it's really easy to project a message out in kind of the read-only web, which is kind of, you know, here's Dan as a talking you know, figure up on the web, and uh, here's what I have to say. It's, there, it's, it's totally different when it's unscripted yeah. and, and, and normalized, and where people feel that uh, the, the real truth is coming out externally. And, and there's just an honesty that comes with your external, being, being willing to say and have conversations externally. Well, I really appreciate you coming on theCUBE, and I want to get your take for our CrowdChat product out there. For the folks out there, Dan's an early adopter, power user of our CrowdChat engagement container, engagement cloud, whatever you want to call it. It's a tool that we built and spun out a separate company to engage the crowd, instrument it, create a transcript on the hashtag. So first, tell the folks, are you happy with it? What, what, what do you, what's your experience like? You know, we, we love it. We, we use it about once a month. Um, I'm running a technology transformation stream, so like, like many things, we're planning six different work streams that are all like moving in the sa at the same time to try to get towards objectives. And one of the problems that we've had is that uh, with this very large number of people that are participating and with the time zone challenges, um, it's really hard to have meetings that fit everyone's needs. And so, yeah, we rotate around the clock, but the also thing that we pick up is the natural transcript of the conversation. 
because in, in the transformational working groups, what's happening is that we're having, we're bringing meaningful requirements together, we're making decisions based upon those requirements, we're constantly agile about uh, amending those, and so using uh, the CrowdChat function allows us to engage many more people in the conversation, which hopefully means if you're gathering requirements from a lot more customers or employees, you're gathering the right requirements, you're able to focus, uh, you have the transcript, so you actually have the, the record of all of that, and then as you begin to move forward by doing it transparently as well, the engagement factor is much higher downstream as well. Yeah, and the hashtag gives you a built-in advertising kind of navigation button where you can clip. But have you guys found that you've gotten people from LinkedIn? Because Twitter chats are just Twitter, but the, yeah. our idea was to have this multiple network overlay. Have you had success with that? Absolutely, I mean, you know, we, we've gone a couple dimensions on this. So we typically start out our transformation streams doing an update. That update we're normally now doing on Google Plus, right, on Google Hangouts, because that's one of the best ways, and then, and then simulcasting on YouTube. And so we're kind of briefing the world on what we're doing, and then we're dropping back into the discussion. Right, is it right, is it wrong? Have we thought about X, have we thought about Y? Um, and we're doing that um, across LinkedIn participants and, and, uh, and Twitter participants. Uh, given our population, right, we have a lot of people that are on LinkedIn. They tend to be more senior in their careers. And, um, and, and, and to some extent, the more technically savvy are on Twitter. But having the bridge between the two worlds is actually really important for us. So the thing I'm impressed with, I want to get your comment on this, is that um, there's a lot of passive listening tools out there and you can always get all that data. But what you guys are doing is you're actively you're investing in active conversations that you're, you're harnessing, and then you got the, the, not only the data for everyone to consume asynchronously, but then you got the data science behind it. So I got to ask you, uh, is that going to be, you're going to do more of that? And two, do you think our business model of freemium and the paid data science is a good strategy? So, um, so yeah, I, I think the data science is where the money is, right? The, uh, the, the collaboration tool is a means to an end, just like, you know, I expect everyone to give away sensors in order to pick up the, the back-end telemetry. Um, and, and I think that that's an important piece of the, of the value proposition. Uh, for us, what's important is, is the engagement models. Right, anytime you're trying to affect change, what you're trying to figure out is who are the influencers. And so by being able to see who's engaged around what, where their sweet spots are, um, how they're engaging, who they're also engaging with, what their social network looks like, you begin to kind of peel back the onion on this, and you begin to recognize that that big data is incredibly rich that we can begin to harvest. What is some of the feedback you've got internally? People are like, I don't know how to use it. They think it's like a Ferrari, they learn how to drive it, and then did it get going? Do people like it? What's your general takeaway? So, you know, I see, um, I see a fairly standard approach, uh, especially for people who aren't kind of social natives. And uh, that approach is, well, I'm going to go and sign up for an account so that I can join. And I join and I kind of watch. And I might ask one question, or I might vote for people. <laughs> and, but, but then what happens is I think about it, and they get more comfortable, and maybe they talk to their kids, I don't know what happens. The next time around, right, they're a little bit more engaged, and then the next time around, they're even more engaged. And so what's happening is we're watching the engagement metrics come up with key contributors, and, and one of the big challenges that I've been pushing is, look, every employee is responsible for their own career. And, and so having something that you want to say in the marketplace is incredibly important, and convincing people that this is a suitable forum Right, that, that in which it's really safe for them to go out and have an opinion. Even if it conflicts with me or the executive management, it's incredibly important. And we have uh, support all the way up and down our executive ranks for that. So Dan, I just want to follow up on that. That's a huge thing, right? So before people were inhibited by, you know, what, what's corporate, corporate marketing going to say? I got to run everything past them. It's all got to be scrubbed and tested and checked, yeah. which I think is really part of this presentation mode as opposed to conversational mode because I'm going to have this nice PowerPoint or PDF and I'm going to show it in, Maybe I'll take some questions at the end. I mean, how to A, you as a company, be willing to accept people maybe having slightly differences of opinion or just saying something stupid, yeah. and then B, really encouraging kind of mid-level people um, that hey, your, your insight is appreciated and we're willing to let you take the risk to make that contribution because we think the benefits outweigh the, uh, the negatives. It's a, it's a great question. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, you know, uh, being a global company, right, we have different, um, Different societies, um, you know, Northern Europe is different than Eastern Europe, is different than France, is different than the UK, is different from the East Coast, is different from the West Coast. Just the social norms, and it's right? And the social norms are just different, and uh, how they expect to interact with their, with their employer and the relative power of a manager or not is, is, is still a hard thing for anyone to manage. But the most important thing is we sit here and, and talk to employees as being fully empowered no matter where they are. Uh, whether at the top of the company or at the bottom of the company, and uh, there needs to be a corporate imperative that transparency is to be expected, right? And then asking a question, right, so long as it's in good taste, 
right, right is appropriate, right. and and that quite honestly, in that same notion of empowerment, you know, you have to take control of what's appropriate and not within the forum in which you're participating. If you know that it's open, which they all are for us, then then you need to be a little bit more careful. And sometimes we do have sidebars, and that's allowed too. So we're we're we're, we're not being um, uh, authoritarian in any way on this. We're we're just trying to say, look, be responsible. Yeah, you mentioned also. Approach. You mentioned also that uh, prior to we going on, you mentioned that your public opinion is more is the truth, and there's a lot of sidebar private conversations. That's a huge cultural leap. I want you to expand on that and share with the audience your perspective there and how that's been received internally. And two, what have been some of the dynamics when you're out in the crowd? And I'm talking about in the crowd. I'm not talking about like, not necessarily crowd chat, but like when you're out in the open, whether it's hangouts or crowd chat, not necessarily in some forum app, like a chatter app on Salesforce or something that's in a uh, predefined uh, system. Right. Out in the wild, representing in public, What's the dynamic there? The, the, the dynamic sum is, is certainly interesting, right? I mean, you know, I still, I, I would bet that 2% uh, of my tweet traffic is private, right? It's DM, not, not, not yeah. public, right? And that's, and that's okay for me. But what, what, I've, what I've really noticed is that people tend to trust me when I am willing to say something externally. And this goes for our partners, right? Like, like Oracle and EMC and Cisco and our other partners, right? Um, if I'm willing to say something in public, then it's probably the truth. Because I've said it externally and so I'm now accountable for it. And accountability really comes down to everything. Uh, versus if I say it behind closed doors, there's a, there's a well-known culture of pocket vetoes or I didn't say that, he said, she said, yeah, and yeah. the accountability's lost. And I think what, what all of our employees are looking for is that transparent, accountable leadership. And that's really what I'm trying to bring forward. Because if you really want a, a team to come together and be cohesive, you have to have that transparency as a team. You have to understand motivations, and, and you have to be willing to uh, put yourself out there. And if you do that, other people will do the same. And what you find is then an open culture where people question things, and we know what happens with open cultures, right? They're, they're right far more than they're wrong. I mean, crowdsourcing has told us that. Yeah, and you also get the data sourcing on the, on the, with the content, content piece of the active. But the also interesting dynamic is this brings in our conversation, Jack, about mobile infrastructure. With virtual workforces, by fleshing people out of these common spaces, these public spaces that are essentially virtual, yeah. but yet public, an interesting dynamic is they have, it's self-governed. Yeah. This is the classic <laughs> self-governing model of, oh boy, I can't say something stupid or throw a haymaker at someone unless I want to be prepared to defend it. Right. Or, take it in the shorts. But that's, I mean, that's leadership, right? That's accountable leadership, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that I, I, I need to set an example, which is that you know, I'm going to have points of view. I'm going to put them out there for debate. And I need to be prepared, right, to, to deal with the consequences of that, and that's okay. If I sat here and said, you know what, flash doesn't matter in this new world in which you know, we have append-only data, well then, then by golly, you know, then, then take it to me. I'm not going to say that to you because I think it's wrong, but <laughs> yeah. you know, the fact of the matter is you have a point to Someone will clip it out and take it out of context. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely they will, and that's the problem, right? And here the context is public. Right. And so someone else is going to call them out. This is what we don't do enough in data science is this notion of peer review, yeah. right? We learned about all these benefits of peer-oriented programming. Right, and we kind of said, ah, yeah. you know. But, but now what about peer review on data science? Yeah. Right, so if that gets done publicly it's now. It's so funny, Jeff was there when we created the crowd captain title, which I basically invented because I needed another Twitter handle. But now <laughs> as the top vote, top vote is the crowd captain. So what's interesting is that brought up a, um, a peer mechanic, game mechanic with peers, such that the votes themselves, you can actually have a captain of the conversation. So if you think about it, you can be a captain of a conversation yep. and be authoritative and yep. be a leader, yep. and you can be a follower of a conversation and be a participant, yep. or just be consumer. So you have a variety of personas. So I think one of the things that I'm super excited about, and I think yep. you're really doing a great job, and I appreciate you, the testimonial insights, that it's the persona at the individual level that changes in context to the situation. Absolutely. So the behaviors change in context to the forum that they're in. Well, what's, what's really interesting, I mean, to, to play on that, right? What, what we're looking for, I mean, look at platforms like Smarterer, right? We're, we're in this position in which we're, we're really trying to gauge the expertise of employees against specific topics, whatever those are. And it's, it's important to understand who your leaders are in key areas. For people who are more junior in the organization, it gives them the opportunity to be much bigger than they are in certain areas that may be more valuable to the, to the company in the future. And here you're going to be able to track the progression of people. Yeah. You, you know, and these, these are important. And the, this is the cloud score thing really kind of screwed everyone over because this, the cloud score is about who's the best blogger or the most active. Yeah. When in reality, the most authoritative person from our data we're seeing across all the chats is, like you mentioned, there's a pattern, they're lurking, 
and then they might jump in, get their feet wet, but it's the person that might not have the highest cloud score rating yep. is actually the one with the most, quote, clout in any given vertical. Right. Because just because they tweeted a few times doesn't make them less authoritative. When you go through the micro-segmentation, right, because just saying, hey, you know, it's about cloud or it's about big data, yeah. right, it's like total washing. What you want to know is like, who is my HDFS, you know, high availability master? <laughs> right, who's the one who jumps in and eats apart, you know, NetApp or EMC when they make claims about HDFS performance, right? Now all of a sudden, like, I, I know who that person is, and that's incredibly valuable when you get into the micro-segmentation that's certainly now possible because of the awesome. deep analytics. So final segment on this, and we'll move on to the next one. For the folks out there, share with them, in your opinion, whether it's an investor or a potential customer at CrowdChat, what they should, why they should use it, use the freemium and or adopt the CrowdChat model. Well, I think it, it really comes down to, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a open platform of engagement. And you need the platform of engagement in order to capture the information. But you're not using the engagement platform in an unmanaged way. The really important thing is to have a goal in mind and to, to kind of judge your position against that goal requires the analytics. So for me, being a goal-oriented person, I want to know what the analytics are and how I'm closing in on my goal. And so I need the engagement platform to collect the data, i.e. that's my sensor, right? But the really important data is actually in the big data store behind it that I'm using to actually find the right kind of operational tweaking of my model to get me to that goal faster. Appreciate it, Dan. Now let's talk about Oracle, because Larry kind of talks about big data. It's, it's, we, we, we bundle it in with everything. He said that in his keynote yesterday. We include it to the system. Like he includes big data. Okay, well that's cool. Big yeah. data is everywhere. It's you great. Can harnessing data everywhere. Um, whether it's marketing cloud or human capital uh, management or whatever system, yep. you're seeing kind of the stuff that you've been working on at CSC around orchestration in the cloud as a key enabler. So yep. I want you to talk about the trend that kind of is teased out by Oracle, but is really more broader across the board, which is a consumption model is changing for the customer. I have diverse infrastructure and systems. Yep. I have new software architecture coming in on top of it. What does that mean for a customer? And you guys work with a lot of top customers. Explain to them kind of what the bottom line is. And obviously, you, there's not always there's not a one Oracle shop. There's not a one SAP shop. There's not a one EMC shop. Yep. There's a variety of different things. What does this all mean for orchestrating it, managing it, all those things that you guys are building out? Well, you know, we're kind of moving in, in the same model as uh, as Cloud Chat around how we actually operate and, and, and manage diverse hybrid clouds, you know, complex infrastructure. Uh, because you know, one of the biggest problems an integrator has always had is how do I actually, how do I actually integrate the, com the control plane? Right in such a way that I can deal with the natural diversity in the landscape, or how do I how do I actually reason over complex log chains? Uh, because I've got operational logs flying in through my cyber side, I've got them coming in through my infrastructure side. I've got app logs coming in. I've got my service mesh logs that are logging my hybrid cloud apparatus, and so we're using big data really, really aggressively. But we're having to really perform a tap on the data. So existing systems like um, what do you mean putting a tap on the data? So so. Um, what I'm finding in big data is that they're really a fairly standard set of enterprise integration patterns that we've been talking about for years, right? And they're about 25 integration patterns. And there are really two, two key strategies. The net is that we're creating service chains. You know, you're kind of putting a collector and then a transformer and then a processor and then an enricher and then a linker and then a, you know, and you begin to link up these things. And ETLs, right, are a traditional way yeah. that we used to kind of build these, but they tended to be fairly static and they tend, tended to be kind of batch oriented. And not flexible. And, and inflexible. Yeah. But you know, in application design patterns, as we move from Gang of Four to now enterprise integration patterns, there's this element of a tap, and the a tap is basically what the government does on your telephone lines, okay? Which is I listen in, and I don't just collect summary data like call detail records that that might be of value to a system manager, but I, instead I actually include packet data because I may actually find deep insight in the packet data that's flowing across, some of which may be having problems coming across the line for whatever reason. And, and by doing that across multiple system boundaries and then putting our analytics on top of that big data uh, platform, we're able to find brand new insights about systems, why they aren't working, how much they really cost to operate, which systems are actually integrated that we didn't know were integrated. All, all of these questions have been really, really hard questions and, and I think that big data is a part of everything. And by the way, the security holes are like Swiss cheese. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, there's a lot of security issues. I mean, Jeff, we were talking earlier about people using the HVAC system coming in, getting admin rights, and once they get in, 
this perimeter-based security is breached, it's, it's over. It's done, right? Micro-segmentation is the way that we have to go. Everything's going to have a new firewall on, a, on each compartmentalized piece of the application. Uh, we're going to you know, move forward with uh, every application being hybridiz hybridizable, so that I can literally take an application and move it around clouds in order to change its surface area, because like a virus, right, it's looking for a binding site, and if I can move that binding site around uh, a lot in the infrastructure, maybe I can deal with an obfuscation yeah. and get away from someone trying to breach me. They're, they're everywhere, but the bigger thing is actually knowing how these different pieces are built, and then being able to use query across how they're built, right? Most people had heart bleed problems, now they have you know, bash shell shock problems, yeah. right? But heart bleed was really hard. What, do, what did most companies do? They took you know, all, their integrate, all their administrators and they put them onto keyboards to log into systems to figure out if they had, they had the open SSH package. And I'm like, that is the craziest that thing I've ever force, seen. Never but you know, if if on install every package had registered itself in a big data store, and now I literally run a query and say which systems are running open SSH, and they go one, two, three, seven, and nine. Yeah. And then I say, well, you know, what bundle were those all those built from? Oh, it's bundles one and bundles three. So I'm now gonna go and version bundles one and bundle three, re-release, that patches automatically. I'm able to change the dynamic from days, right, to minutes. Yeah, and by the way, the days to minutes on the window, but also the damage, the consequences to the infrastructure and cost is, is I mean, you can't even quantify, it's massive. Um, so that's a speed game. Yep. So the second thing I want to ask you is, um, DevOps creates a lot of a new engineering opportunities, which is good and bad, depending on how you look at it. Uh, one is, is that developers are now coming in-house in the universe. So I want to get your perspective on this. Yep. Are you seeing um, the same trend we're seeing with enterprises onboarding in-house developers. Sure. Um, where it used to be CSC used to handle a lot of the development for the customers. Now, we want to see developers in-house, those are app developers, iPhone, yep. putting stuff on, yep. native stuff, maybe some native app, but basically mostly you know, stateless applications through APIs. Yep. So that's a trend. Do you see that trend? And how do they do that? Because most enterprises haven't hired in-house developers since the mainframe days. Yeah, so um, I, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. So I, I want to say yes, I see more architectural control being brought back in-house. Um, but I still see the talent economy being being pretty uh, pretty strong, and so I am seeing a lot of you know small targeted consultancies begin to come in with targeted skills to focus in. So it's forcing us to rethink our portfolio. It's not just about having a big infrastructure business. It's about having a big infrastructure business with you know 42 specialties within it, in which I can literally point to the person and say they're the best in X, yep. and have that be really valuable to customers. I think customers still aren't set up for the most part uh, to uh, it, to be double deep with their business, right? to be deep technology experts, but also deep business experts, right? DevOps is all about bringing the business and technology together, and most CIOs are not well, not, not really well vested in that uh, digital leadership boundary that we're beginning to see attached, so. Yeah, and you need speed, too. You mentioned the speed issue with the, yeah. heart, with the heart beating it's, that shell shock. So what are you guys doing? Are you guys and, becoming more of a, a provider for enabling them to do that? What's your, what's I, I think what's, there's a piece of uh, ecosystem builder that's in this, much like yourself, which is to say that uh, having a trusted DevOps catalog, right, that is full of componentry, right, that we have a known set of regulated entities that are accessing and contributing to with strong version control, begins to create the basis of a next generation app store for the enterprise. Um, this comes down to our blueprints, right? Service Mesh, our agility platform, has the notion of giving developers proven blueprints to start with. Now, not every developer is going to go, oh yeah, I want to start with a blueprint, right? I've seen this reuse game like <laughs> over and over before. But what we do know is that is that there is a challenge still between getting something from development into production yeah. in a regulated enterprise, right? Because there are policies and regulations that you have huge. to conform. Yeah. And so what we're seeing especially in our global. large- Especially global. Global's huge, right? Basel IV, yeah. it's, it is incredibly cumbersome. And so what I need to do is create blueprints that have already pre, been pre-approved through those regulations. And now as someone, as a developer goes in, I give some of the more powerful developers the right to override. But when they override, they declare what they're overriding. So now I don't have to go and check the whole thing, I just check exactly what they changed. And that gives me even more agility. And so for me, it's going to be all about building up these blueprints for our enterprise customers and establishing an ecosystem so as, develop, or as our enterprises start building their own blueprints, I'm able to share them. Because that's a value economy in which there is really a transfer of value. And how do the vendors play into that? Obviously, engineer systems is what Oracle says. You just gave the, uh, you were just gave your theater session uh, presentation. Um, yep. What is the role? Obviously, EMC's had some success with, with uh, VBlock. Yep. Um, what's your take on this? Are they going to be actively involved? And but, you know, I think you know, as, as software eats the world, right? Infrastructure gets dumber. 
and uh, I think engineered systems will still be very valuable. What we've done is we've decided to take a step forward in the economy, right? Which is to say, it used to be that we used to be the ones who felt that it was our charter to build engineered systems, whether it be a VCE or an Oracle engineered system. I think that's a mistake. Both those companies are putting billions of dollars into massively integrated portfolios. What I need to do is take a step forward and say, how do you use those? Yeah. Right? How do you target those? How do you actually use the best of what those provide? And by the way, that ecosystem doesn't end there. Right? I'm talking about Amazon, I'm talking about Azure, I'm talking about Rackspace, right? in, in terms of my cloud portfolio, and all of these are competing for enterprise workloads. What I want to be is the best person to say, the needs of your software are best met by this provider. Okay, so true or false, general purpose computing is dead. False. Okay, so this general computing, there is general computing. Okay, what's, what is still left? Is that called um, um, infrastructure as a service? <laughs> it, it, it probably is, or utility, you know, let's go back. No, right? but, no but you bring up back a good point. Back to the dark ages, utility point. services. You need commodities that you can benchmark, okay. but you also need to make sure that the commodities come forward and declare what they're best at, right? Because everyone can be treated as a commodity, but some can also be best at other things. Yeah, so commodity would be price, Larry brought this up, pricing based, yep. cheap and yep. available, a lot of competition, yep. be, be best and be ocean. cheap. And then on top of that, that's where the differentiation comes Ab in. Absolutely, and our goal, right, is to allow developers to make use of the differentiation, but to understand why they're locked in to that differentiated function, especially when it's sole source. So we do see our customers looking for increased contestability of infrastructure. And that really means figuring out what that new commodity model begins to look like. And then how to recommend and deploy the specialism in the right tool for the right job kind of thing, so you're not a hammer looking for a nail. At, at a minimum, what starts to happen is that all those decisions become visible. And for me, just to that point about transparency, visibility is what the CIO is looking for. They're tired of the pocket deals with partners that then get something that gets wired in, so I'm now in a proprietary platform in which I don't have, which I'm subscale for skill yeah. over time. And then, so this, and the other point you made earlier I thought was worth capturing is using big data to capture in so you can identify the systems that may or may not be exposed to whatever exploitation, <laughs> threat, a breach. Right, or, or even being able to reason on whose who's pricing tends to be trending in what dimension across a broad ecosystem. And so if I'm trying to make a forward plan in IT, a lot of people say, hey, I've got a capital refresh in two years, I've got to set the budget now. What should I set that budget at? Now all of a sudden, once we begin to pick up that longitudinal record, I'm going to be able to pick up some real data that can be shared across our ecosystem around what systems and what geographies are trending towards what ratios. Well, you guys are way ahead of the curve. I got to say, CSC compared to your, the other firms out there are well ahead on the, on the ethos of data-driven. Congratulations, really appreciate it. I'm not just saying that because you're a CrowdCheck customer. <laughs> I'm just saying is that big data from security to uh, process improvement is changing. You guys are well ahead. Dan, Thanks for coming on theCUBE. My pleasure. Thanks, John. Uh, Dan Hutch, the CTO at CSC, uh, really changing the game, helping people figure out the future of this modern infrastructure, modern IT, modern cloud, you, whatever you want to call it. It's disruptive, it's changing the game, of course, increasing profits and lowering costs. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after the short break live in uh, San Francisco at Oracle Open World 2014. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Furrier. We'll be right back.